hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed, rich is eternal and blessing supernal from his presence to my... Good morning and welcome to the Lake Road Church of Christ. We're so happy that you're with us this morning, that we can share some time together in worship and praise of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, it's always great that we as Christians can come together and, and worship him in spirit and truth. And uh, before we begin our service this morning, let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the plan of salvation. We're so thankful that you have provided us the word of life, Jesus Christ. And Father, we're so grateful that he died upon a cross, that cruel cross of Calvary for our sins. And Father, we're so grateful that our sins are forever nailed to the cross. And Father, we're also thankful for the word of Christ, the message of the gospel, the word that saves us, the word that is the power of God to salvation for all who believe. And Father, we pray that as we consider more of your word in our lives, we'll begin to live more like Jesus each and every day. Father, be with us this morning. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This will be part of our lesson this morning. And if you would, read along with me as we go through uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 together. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 
But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Isaiah tells us about what it means to be pardoned. He tells us in Isaiah chapter 55 and about verse 7, verse 6 or 7. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The idea of pardon shows us that we are guilty before God because of sin. But because of his pardon, we're no longer guilty. Yes, we've committed a crime, but that crime is no longer held against us. Let's think about that significant thought this morning in light of Jesus Christ, his shed blood, upon the cross of Calvary. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful this morning to be here to remember back to Calvary some 2,000 years ago in which our Lord and Savior was crucified upon the cross. Father, this morning as we think back to Calvary and we remember His death, we can't help but think about His body upon the cross. Thinking about all the suffering he had to endure on our behalf. And Father, we know that your word tells us that the Christ had to suffer and die. And for that plan, Father, we're so thankful because he was willing to suffer and die for us. And Father, now as we partake of the bread that symbolizes his body upon that cross, we pray that we will do so in a manner that's pleasing to you in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as we consider this morning the blood of Jesus Christ, and we consider the sacrifice upon Calvary, reminded of the book of John, uh, book of 1 John, that is, in chapter 2, where John writes, my little children, I write these things unto you that you might not sin. But if any man sin, let him know we have an advocate 
Jesus Christ the righteous, who is a propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And the idea is, is that the blood of Christ was shed for the world. And primarily, as we think about the blood in our worship to Christ, it's those who are in Christ who have the efficacy of that blood. That is, the power of the blood is upon God's children, those who are in Christ. And so what a blessing it is to know that we have the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Christ. And as Paul would write in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, he tells us that we have all blessings, all spiritual blessings in Christ. Let's be thankful for that this morning as we are reminded of the blood of Jesus that, for, that forgives us and cleanses us from all sin. Father, we're so thankful for Jesus and we're so thankful for the cross of Calvary without which we would not have pardon, without which we would not have the forgiveness of sins and the shedding of our Savior's blood. And Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was that unspotted lamb, the perfect sacrifice that could remedy our sin situation. And Father, we're thankful to be here this morning to recall Calvary and to remember Jesus dying upon that cross, shedding his blood for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to the Lake Road Church of Christ. We are appreciative of your presence this morning with us, and we are thankful that those who have stopped by and are visiting with us this morning as we worship God together. We have been in a series of lessons entitled Go Into the Light, wherein we're talking about how God is light. And we get that from 1 John chapter 1, beginning in about verse 8. Five, where John writes, uh, we have received, uh, this is the message we have received from him and declare unto you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we do not practice the truth. So God is light. And because God is light, we're expected to walk in the light. And that's the point that he makes in the following verse. He says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, 
we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So God is light. In him there is no darkness. But at the same time, if we declare to ourselves, to our fellow man, and even to God, that we are in fellowship with him, but yet continue in sin, then we lie not practicing the truth. So right there we need to underscore the fact that truth has everything with the light, has everything to do with the light. And God is light. And Jesus himself says that he is the light of the world. And so we know that Jesus is also God, and God is light. For John also writes in his gospel, in John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John makes a clear distinction that Jesus is not God the Father, but he is God the Son. And so he is distinct from the Father, and he is distinct from the Holy Spirit. But yet he is the Word, the eternal Word of God, and it says the Word was God. He was part of the eternal Godhead. The Bible also tells us in that same passage that all things were made by him or through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So the point is, is that Jesus being God, he is the creator. He is the one that brought into existence all things and all life. And he is the life and the light of men. And that's the point that we're referring to when we talk about light. Light is life, yet life is light. And if we are in Christ, we are in God. And if we're in God, we have life. That is, we are in life. Because we are in his light, the light of his word. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But as he continues, he says, after Jesus had created all things, he says, and he is the life, and the life was the light of men. So light came into the world by the Father via Jesus Christ, who himself identified who the Father was, by proclaiming his light, and that light was his gospel. The light of the gospel. And we'll hit that in just a moment as well. So as we consider God is light, this morning we're going to do three things. We're going to, number one, we're going to read a passage of Scripture. In fact, we'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and the first six verses of first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And then as we're reading, we're going to interpret the passage together. That is, we're going to explain what Paul is writing, what Paul is saying throughout that passage of Scripture. And then lastly, we're going to simply apply to our lives what we have read. So let us go to the passage under consideration this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, going on into chapter 4 and verses 1 through 6. So Paul writes for us, beginning in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Now we need to stop right there and understand the context a little bit better. The context is dealing with we and ourselves. The we and ourselves in this passage is not you and I. Let me repeat that again. The we in ourselves does not include you and I. The we in ourselves in this passage are the we in ourselves of the context. And when we go back to chapter 1, the we in our, ourselves are identified as Paul and Timothy. And so he's talking about, Paul's talking about himself along with Timothy. We might throw into the mix other apostles, but it's certainly not you and I as we will clearly see as we begin to go through the text. So again, do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? And the you here is the Corinthians. He's writing to the church at Corinth, 
And therefore, we must understand that the letter that Paul is writing is to them, but the letter that's written to them is for us. So we are part of the you in this context. So he says, or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters, letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Holy Spirit but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And so Paul here is right away making a distinction about what is written and how it was written. He says that uh, the word here that he's talking about, written not with the ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, was written on their heart. And that's what Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah chapter 31. The very fact is, is that he would write his law in our heart. Therefore, whenever we live by his word, by his law, we do the things that he asks us to do on his behalf, then we are having the word of God written in our hearts. It's, we're living according to what God is expecting from us. And he makes that clear distinction. He says, this writing is, is on your heart and it's not on tablets of stone. And right away, what comes to mind or what ought to come to our minds is the fact that uh, Moses had written the Ten Commandments uh, and they were written on the stone tablets. And so he's making a distinction between the cold stone of the law and the law that's written on our heart. So... We need to understand that uh, metaphor that he's making here uh, in that way. So he says, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, talking about himself again, along with Timothy, <clears throat> not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, they were ministers of God. And Paul is talking about the revelation that he received from God that didn't come from men. And it certainly didn't come from himself. He didn't invent these words, but they were given to him. And thereby he was now giving those words to the Corinthians and by extension to the rest of mankind, you and me. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency or their ministry is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. So right away we go back to the thought of, of this writing being done on our hearts and not on tablets of stone. And now he's saying that he and others are the ministers of the new covenant, not the old covenant, because the old covenant had passed away. The old covenant was nailed to the cross, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, and also in Colossians as well, that the law was nailed and taken out of, out of the way, removed by the cross of Jesus Christ. That cross, the death of Christ, ushered in the new covenant. And that's what Jesus was referring to in Matthew chapter 26 when he talked about the new covenant in his blood. That new covenant was ratified and brought into effect by his death through his blood. So as uh, he goes on to say, he is, God has made them sufficient as ministers of the new covenant not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, he's not talking about anything different here. It's still the same subject. 
Still a comparison and a contrast. The comparison is the new covenant with the old covenant. The tablets of stone and the tablets of the heart. And now he's saying the letter kills. The letter referring to the old law, to the law of Moses. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now the Spirit here is in reference to the Holy Spirit, but more accurately, it is also a figure of speech whereby one word stands in place of another word. So, what he's saying is, not of the old covenant, the letter, the law of Moses, but of the Spirit, but of the new covenant. The new covenant came by the Spirit. The Spirit provided revelation, and by inspiration, the apostles spoke that message, the new covenant message. And that new covenant message was the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, the letter kills, not because it's unrighteous, not because the law itself is a murderer. No, on the contrary. The old law, the law of Moses, was righteous and just, but it didn't have a Savior attached to it. It had a Savior in prospect, but Jesus had yet to come. And so when Jesus did come, the old law had to be put away. And Jesus ushers in the new covenant, the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here he says, that comes from the Spirit. And the Spirit spoke through the apostles. And the apostles spoke to mankind, of which you and I are part of. And so we don't live by the old law. We don't live by the old covenant. We don't live by the old letter. But we live by the Spirit. That is, we live by the new covenant that has come from the Spirit. That's the point that he's making here. Now, notice some terms that pop up along the way that kind of help us see that picture a little bit clearer. He says, but if the ministry of death, again, referring to the Old Testament, but if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, Ten Commandments, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. Now, the reference here is that when Moses had gone up into the mountain, he met God, and God spoke to him face to face. That's what Moses wanted God to do in the first place. But God had to manifest himself because the Bible tells us in the book of Exodus that God cannot see man as he is and live. You can't look at God and live. So God has to supernaturally manifest himself in such a way that Moses can see that manifestation but not the actual person of God, the actual being of God. So Moses is in this little cave, if you will, and God said, I will pass by. And as he passes by through the hole of the cave, Moses sees the back end of God. His hind quarters is literally the rendering. That's what Moses saw. And so Moses could not actually see God and live. So God covered himself availed himself, manifested himself in such a way that Moses could see him in some fashion and in some form. But when he saw God, he too became white as light, white as snow. And you remember, there was a glow about Moses. And when he had descended the mountain in order to give the law to the people, the people could no longer look at Moses. At his face, it was just too bright because he had been in the presence of the Lord. And so Moses had to put a veil on his face as he gave the Israelites the law of the Lord, the law of Moses. 
And so that's why Paul here is referencing that incident where he says the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, his appearance. Which glory was passing away? While the glory of his face beginning to fade away, that is, he was going back to his old self, it took time. That is also in reference to the law in which Moses had given the people. The Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses began to fade away the moment he began citing that law to the people. And so the law would serve its purpose in helping the Jews live for God, but at the end of that law would be Christ, according to Romans chapter 10, beginning in verses 4 and 5, that Christ was the end of the law. And that uh, when the law uh, was done away with, the seed would come in Galatians chapter 3 in verse 19. So the seed would come when the law ended. So Jesus would come and he would establish a new law, the new covenant. Because the old was not meant to last, as we've just read. And we'll continue reading. He says, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? So let's stop right there. The ministry of the Spirit is equal to that which comes from the Spirit. Right? It was the flesh and the Spirit. It was the Spirit that brought in and ushered in the New Covenant. And the New Covenant was that which Paul and Timothy were ministers of. They were the ministers of the new covenant. They were ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, for if the ministry of condemnation, that is the law of Moses, had glory, the ministry of righteousness, ah, the ministry of righteousness is simply what he just talked about, which is the ministry of the Spirit, or Simply the Spirit or the New Covenant, right? That's what he's talking about. He's using different terminology to explain the exact same thing. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The New Covenant is the ministry of the Spirit. It is the ministry of righteousness. The Old Covenant was the letter and it was the... uh, ministry of condemnation. And as he continues on, he says, for even what uh, what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. The book of Hebrews is about that very thought. The book of Hebrews concerns a group of Christians. They were Jewish people. They had converted to Christianity. That is, they believed in Jesus Christ. And they were baptized into Christ. And therefore began living according to the new covenant. To the gospel of Jesus Christ. But these Jews, these Jewish Christians, began to... Go back to the law. Go back to Moses. Because there was pressure being put on them by perhaps their families, by their relatives, by the town folk, by the city folk, so much that they would jeopardize their own souls in leaving Jesus and going back to Moses and the law and worshiping according to to the law of Moses. Well, that's what the book of Hebrews is about. But in the book of Hebrews, the writer tells us that there is a much greater, uh, a much better high priest, better promises, and uh, there is much more glory involved in the new covenant than there is in the old, because the old had passed away. The old was nailed to the cross. 
And what remains, that's the new covenant, is more glorious than Moses, more glorious than the law of Moses, more glorious than the old covenant. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. So, the, Jew, the Jewish people of Paul's day, who were resistant to the movement called Christianity, they were resistant to Jesus Christ, they were resistant to the apostles' teaching. Paul's saying they were living with a veil over their eyes because when they read the Old Testament, they're not seeing Jesus. They're not seeing the promises of Jesus. Nor are they seeing the promise of a new covenant with better promises. So they are stuck in the past. And the past cannot help them. Well, that kind of like sounds like some people today. They live by their own traditions rather than the teaching of Jesus. Or they live by their own religions instead of the religion of Jesus Christ. So when they read their Bibles, when they study their Bibles, they have a veil, as it were, over their face like Moses, and like the Jews of the days of Paul. So again, Paul says, But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, whether Jew or Gentile. Whenever one turns to the Lord, that veil is removed. That veil is is that which separates them from Jesus Christ. But when the new covenant, the gospel is preached to people in need of Jesus Christ, to people in need of obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they accept the message, and they believe in Jesus to the point that they're going to obey the gospel and being baptized into Jesus Christ, Paul says that veil is removed. They can see clearly what Jesus is talking about, what the New Testament, the New Covenant is all about. So again, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of, uh, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now we come into chapter 4. Paul continues. He says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, what ministry? The ministry of the Spirit. The ministry of righteousness. The Spirit. The new covenant. That's the ministry. He says, Therefore, since... We have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Who's the we? The we of the context is still Paul, still Timothy, those who were chosen to preach the gospel message. Timothy has come to help Paul and has become a great helper for Paul. And Paul has been training Timothy for much of his life at this point. And so they're going about on their missionary campaigns, their missionary journeys, preaching the gospel and establishing churches of Christ along the way. So he says, we don't lose heart. We keep on going. But that's a principle for you and me. He says, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, 
not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. So now we have a new terminology, a new word inserted here in the text by Paul. The word is simply the ministry which they were in charge of. It was the ministry of the new covenant. It was the ministry of the spirit. It was the ministry of righteousness. Therefore, it's the word of God they were proclaiming. That's the point of this passage. And as we continue, he says, but by manifestation of the truth, the truth, the truth is simply the word of God. Remember in John chapter 17 and verse 17, it says, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. The preaching of God's truth, the preaching of God's word, the preaching of the ministry of righteousness, the preaching of the ministry of the spirit, the preaching of the ministry of the new covenant. All that is under consideration here with these new terms. So the word of God represents all of what Paul has been talking about. The truth represents all of what Paul has been talking about. And then he says, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel, ah, another term. So now we have the truth, the word, the ministry of righteousness, the ministry of the spirit, the spirit rather than the letter, and the new covenant. All those terms imply the same thing. Paul's using a parallelism where all the words, whether they're different in meaning or in concept, they're words that are used together that imply the same thing. In other words, these words are all used synonymously, meaning the same thing. So he says, but even if our gospel, we could say, even if our new covenant, even if the, our uh, ministry of the Spirit, even if our ministry of righteousness is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So we understand here now that in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, what Paul's talking about. He's talking about the new covenant, which came from the Spirit, which the Spirit gave to them, and the Spirit, through them, proclaimed to mankind the saving gospel message. And notice what he says as he continues. He says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Notice that. Jesus saves, yes, he saves. But the gospel is the power of God to salvation. That's how Jesus saves. Jesus is the light of the world. But the light that saves men and the life or the light that gives life to men is the light of the gospel. It's the gospel message proclaimed. It's the gospel message believed. It's the gospel message obeyed. That's what saves you and I. Much of the world wants to separate the teachings, the message, the new covenant, the gospel, the word from Jesus and just claim that Jesus saves them. But that's not how it works. Jesus saves through a means, through his word. Remember, he said, the word which I have spoken, the same will judge you in the last day. John chapter 12 and verse 48. A little bit uh, later, uh, in John chapter uh, 6, we find that Jesus says, uh, the words which I have spoken, they are spirit and they are life. Remember, if they are life, they are light. And if they are light, they are life. It's the light of the gospel that gives life to mankind. Only when mankind is willing to submit to the message, 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, once again, provides us that light because he is light. He is the light of the world, but he has provided the world the light of the gospel by which we all can be saved. And part of that gospel message is this, friends. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, He who, be he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's life that comes from the light of the word of Jesus Christ, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the teaching of the new covenant. You can do that today. If you'd like to be baptized into Jesus Christ and know for a fact and be assured that you have put Jesus Christ on in baptism, that your sins are forgiven you, not because of baptism itself, but because you have obeyed the command to be baptized, you have entered into the light of Jesus Christ. You can do that today. Some of you out there perhaps have done that already. If you've done so, perhaps you've wandered away. You've, you've left the light of the gospel and you've entered back into the darkness of the world. And Jesus calls you home too. And he says, come home, repent. And all you need to do is take that one step and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I repent of my sins and I come back to you. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ this morning and you would like to put Jesus on in baptism, give us a call and we'll study with you. We'll help you. You can do that today and be assured of your salvation. Until we meet again, let's be closed in song and the closing prayer. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. Well, it truly has been good to be with you this morning. It has been good to be in the presence of our Lord. And certainly it's been good to remember Jesus this morning, to remember his sacrifice, and to know that he has provided us the gift of salvation. Let's be assured of that this week and let's close out this morning with a word of prayer. Our loving and righteous Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we've had the opportunity 
this morning to worship you in spirit and truth. Father, we pray that the message that was spoken was beneficial to those listening, that perhaps provided information that can help them in their walk with Jesus. And Father, perhaps it may have motivated others to learn more about Jesus and to learn more about His will for them in their lives. Father, we're so thankful for Your Word. We are thankful for the saving gospel message of Jesus Christ. And it's in the name of Jesus we do pray. Amen.